So broadly, I'm going to be discussing two things. The technical aspect with regards to the grip and the way in which we can actually play the single strokes and some ideas to do with the vocabulary and how we can practice and apply the single strokes. And that's broadly going to be the, the topics for today's video. Um, I want to start out by again reiterating how much I think these are a difficult technique to do. And the reason for this is largely to do with the weak hand. I obviously play a matched grip. Some people play a traditional grip, but nevertheless, for the majority of drummers, we have a dominant hand and a weaker hand. For me, my dominant hand is my right and my weaker hand is the left. And the problem is we are aiming for complete parity with the hands. We are aiming for the left hand to do exactly what the right hand does or vice versa. And if you're like me, you come from a drum kit background, that right hand is playing twice, four times, eight times as many times as the left, eight times as many strokes as the left, that right hand, that dominant hand gets stronger and that weaker hand gets left behind. So one of the most difficult things for me transitioning to the snare drum as a solo instrument has been bringing that weaker left hand up to parity with the right. Uh, who knows how good I could be if my left hand could do what my right hand could do and I'm sure that's the same for most of us. Nevertheless, there are a few fundamentals that we need to consider when it comes to playing a single stroke role. Now, the things I'm going to discuss with regards to grip and technique here, I think are broadly applicable to any rudiment, to any technique, but of course, for, this, for the purposes of today, we are applying them to the single stroke specifically. When we consider the grip, the way in which we actually hold the stick, we need to consider three main elements, the fulcrum, the fingers, and the wrist. And these three elements need to work together in synergy to create the stroke, to create the grip, to create our technique. And generally speaking, and this was the case with me, and this is almost always the case with my own students, a weakness in technique comes down to a weakness in one or more of these elements. And that weakness may be technical, mechanical, or it may be simply in our understanding of what those elements are supposed to achieve. So first of all, in order to play a... Um, useful good sounding controlled single stroke roll we need to get to the point uh, we need to get to the point where we can do this i'm simply bouncing the stick with very very little effort but with complete control and for me that stick is sitting in a fulcrum and the fingers and a little bit of wrist movement are just maintaining momentum so that stick bounces just like a basketball Now in theory, if we can bring our other hand to the same level, the single, stroll, the single stroke roll is created by simply alternating these two things. But of course we find one hand is not quite up to the same level as the other and we can spend an inordinately long amount of time looking at these through a microscope and viewing everything that the weak hand is not doing that the strong hand is and vice versa. Nevertheless, as I've stated, this generally comes down to a weakness in at least one of these fundamentals in the grip. So first of all, the fulcrum. Let me get the elephant in the room out of the way straight away. There is a lot of division within the drumming community as to whether the fulcrum should be between the index finger and the thumb or the middle finger of the thumb. Now in my in my career and in my studies I've been very fortunate enough I've been very fortunate to study with some of the world's best drummers and I won't name names but I've been very very lucky in who I've been able to study with over the years. And I have received tuition from some of the best players in the world who play with an index finger fulcrum and some of the best players in the world who play with a middle finger fulcrum. Both work. Okay, and what's far more important is that A, we have a fulcrum, and B, we understand what that fulcrum is. So please be very wary of any source of authority that tries to tell you it must be this and the other way is wrong. Be very wary of that. Ask why and see if the explanation is good enough, because I have seen firsthand drummers that do both at the absolute highest level. So to reiterate, far more important than where the fulcrum is, is that we have one and we understand what it's supposed to do. Now for me, that fulcrum generally sits quite far forward between the thumb and the index finger. And when I say fulcrum, I mean the part of the hand that simply holds the stick. So you can see for me that stick is held loosely, but strongly, but not too tightly, between the thumb and the index finger. If you prefer a, mid a middle finger fulcrum, we can swap into this position. It doesn't really matter as long as we're comfortable. The whole point here is this is a static portion of the grip around which that stick can rotate. If we think about a bicycle wheel, 
We want this wheel to rotate. It's held in the middle on either side by the axle and the frame. It's kind of the same with the stick. We're holding it from either side and that stick can essentially rotate within that central point. Now it's important to note that for all intents and purposes that fulcrum doesn't move. That stick shouldn't be rolling around, it shouldn't be slipping or rotating in the hands. If that is happening, we likely have a weak fulcrum. We need that thumb to engage a little bit more strongly to hold that stick in position. Once that stick is held in position and has the fulcrum, the pivot, around which to rotate, we can start applying momentum into the stroke using our wrists. Now even at this stage, there is some finger engagement that open and close for every bounce. If my fingers don't engage and they, say, they stay closed at the back of the hand, we can see how that stick has no, no room to bounce back up. So we keep the fingers nice and open and there is a gentle snapping closed on every stroke that allows that stick to be sent downwards and then the momentum rebounds it back up to us again. Now at a slow tempo like this, the wrist needs to engage quite a lot to allow for that rebound. As we speed up, we see that the wrist does less and less and the fingers do more and more. So it's a sliding scale. As the tempo decreases, the wrist motion increases and vice versa. As the tempo increases, the wrist reduces to almost nothing and the fingers take over and do all the work. So if I play as fast as I'm able, there is no wrist there at all. In most practical terms, it's going to be a bit of both, a bit of wrist and a bit of fingers. And ultimately, we're just trying to facilitate the bouncing of those sticks. Now here, I'm at maybe 85%. As I push to the last little bit, the fingers kind of take over completely. But as I pull back a bit, you can see the wrists engage a little bit more. Now, this was a really good piece of advice that was given to me uh, by Rick Dior, who is a phenomenal drummer and teacher and has his own brilliant YouTube channel. And he talked about the position of the stick in the hand should never come right up in here. Now I'm very hesitant to, to use words like never and should, but this was the advice he gave me. We want the stick to be low enough down in our hands that a second stick could be inserted in the gap. If we don't have the gap between our thumb and our hands or between the thumb and the stick, that stick has nowhere to move, which means the fingers can't engage. In order for those fingers to engage, we need this gap here between the thumb, the fingers and the stick and then you can see the stick there rotating in the fulcrum. This directly translates to how the stick will bounce on the pad. If I'm all the way up here, the wrist has to do everything and there's no room for the fingers to move. One of the things I see a lot of my students doing is they hold the stick right up in here, that finger is holding the stick at the knuckle and there's just simply no room for that stick to move within the hand. There's plenty of room in there To let the stick uh, to let the stick move. So that's broadly a simplified overview of what's actually happening here. I think the most important point to take away from this is we want with both hands to get to this point where we can just simply effortlessly and with total control bounce that stick. The fulcrum is strong but relaxed the fingers are doing most of the engagement and the wrists are just rotating slightly to provide a little bit of momentum. But ultimately everything we do is to facilitate that natural bounce of the stick, but it's completely controlled. Now this brings us on to the second part of what I really want to discuss today, which is going to take up the main body of this, I think, which is in how we can practice this and how we can apply this musically. Because we must remember at the end of the day, technique is a tool and that tool needs to be applied into, a, into musical expression into musical performance. Otherwise, what's the point? Now, in reference to my own book, which I released recently, The Snare Drum Virtuoso, a collection of technical studies, I tackled single strokes in the very first section. I wanted single strokes to be at the core of uh, some of the technical studies because, of course, it's such a fundamental uh, technique that we use on the drums. 
And I thought long and hard about how best to write technical studies for the purpose of single stroke roles. And what kind of revealed to me and was taught to me and became clear to me throughout my own practicing is that speed is rarely the issue, despite what we think. We have a lot of drummers that think, I can't play very fast. My single strokes are slow or they're, they're, they're not as fast as I would like. And what, I, what I've found to be true in my experience, and certainly in, in the experience with a lot of my students as well, is that the issue is not speed. The issue is control. And without the control, the speed is meaningless. Now, by way of analogy, we can imagine a car. I've got a, a normal road car sitting on my drive outside. If I were to replace that with a super highly tuned engine, like from a, a supercar or a racing car or something like that, and I went out onto the road and I floored the accelerator, rather than be really, really fast, I'd probably just stay exactly where I am and have an inordinate amount of wheel spin, and I'd ruin my road tires. There's a reason that highly tuned sports cars and racing cars have very, very expensive, specially designed tires, and it's because that power needs to come with the appropriate amount of grip. Without the appropriate amount of grip, the wheels spin, the car doesn't go anywhere, and all of that power is wasted. And I think it works the same way here. We can have all the speed in the world in our wrists and really fly, but if we haven't got the control to alternate that pattern, we're never going to get the single stroke roll. So the difficulty for most people when it comes to speed is not in actually moving fast enough, but is actually alternating cleanly. Any weaknesses in my own speed, or should I say any deficiencies in my own speed, the reason I can't necessarily go faster than that is not because my hands and my muscles can't move fast enough, it's because that's the limit of my control, by which I mean my ability to consistently and accurately keep those sticks alternating. So once I realized this, and I tried it and I believe it to be true, my efforts with regards to the snare drum virtuoso and the technical studies turned to gaining control. And the best way I've found to do this is with the use of French frise figures. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, a French frise or a frise is a French rudiment that is a, uh, the kind of equivalent of a rough, but it can be any note, uh, any stroke lengths. So we might have a frise of three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Or a frise of four. Frise of five, etc. And the accent can be at the beginning or it can be at the end. Now, I've done a video on Frise before if you're interested in exploring that further. But for our current purposes, those shorter Frise, the Frise of three and the Frise of four, are exceptionally difficult if you don't have a certain degree of control. So let me show you what I mean. We can take a simple accent pattern on a single stroke roll, say accenting every third stroke. Gives us a simple accent figure, right? Now, if I replace each accent with two 30 second note single strokes, in effect, replacing them with a frise, we get this. And if we speed that up, or a little bit more, now I'm starting to get to the limit of my control there. Now, here's the problem. If I try that left-handed, It's not bad, but it's not at the same level as my right hand. I have to slow it down and I really have to exaggerate that motion to try and keep the degree of control. That weakness in control directly translates into a general weakness in my single stroke roll. And by weakness, I mean a limitation in how far and how fast I can push it. So a lot of the single stroke figures in the snare drum virtuoso are actually frise figures. So turning to the first uh, single stroke study from that book, page 21, the first four bar phrase runs like this. If I do it nice and slowly. <laughs> it 
and that last that fourth bar there turns us on to the left hand and then we can repeat the same figure and then we're back onto the right hand again and then it continues in a similar vein this is really useful for two reasons First of all, as hinted at a moment ago, we get an idea of some musical application where, in effect, those frise, those two 30-second note single strokes, imply or act as an accent. We can hear the frise there essentially fulfilling the same role as the accent does. So we start to get some idea of how we can apply this material. But secondly, and more pertinent to our current form, our current purposes, is that's really difficult from a control perspective because we're trying to keep uh, coherence between the two hands, that alternating pattern between the two hands at a really quite fast tempo. really fast I mean it's the, the tempo given is 104 BPM you could in theory take that as fast as you like as fast as you are limited to by the control there um, but what we find is that this is not an issue of speed this is an issue of control the reason I can't play this at say 116 BPM is because my left hand control simply can't maintain the clarity of the alternating pattern so so patterns like this especially from bar 5 where it's on the left hand and so on, are a real strong workout, a real good way of bringing that left hand up to something like parity with the right. Now, in reality, we are probably never going to, be, to get there. For those of us not fortunate enough to be uh, ambidextrous, I feel we are always going to have a weaker hand, and it's just trying to address the balance somewhat. Now, I mentioned the frise of four. If we turn to single stroke study two, which is on page 22, it's the same idea at the same tempo, but we are now using 30 second note triplets instead of two 30 second notes. So we're actually inserting a fourth stroke into that figure. And then we've got a six at the end. And there's our figure from the book. But that's just to demonstrate how these frise figures can be used to incorporate our control or to improve our control. So if I slow that down, we're essentially still using that three note pattern, every first of which is an accent. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, rather than convert that accent into two 30 second notes, I'm going to convert it into three by way of a triplet. That's, that's hard, you quickly run out of control there. And hopefully you can see as I'm, as I'm working through these ideas, what I was speaking about at the beginning between the fulcrum, the fingers and the wrists, all engaging to produce those strokes. There has to be some wrist rotation to produce the rhythm, but those fingers have to engage to produce the faster strokes. Try and watch my wrists as I'm doing that. Now, the reason I think this is so effective is to do with a misconception about single strokes. Generally, whenever we think about single strokes, and I think the same applies to double strokes and paradiddles and buzz strokes and anything else really to do with the rudiments, when someone tries to judge their own single stroke role, when they say, do I have a good single stroke role? They think of this. In essence, a long roll. And they think how fast, how loudly, how cleanly, how controlled, how consistently can I play a long roll? 
And that's all well and good. We can work for the rest of our lives on trying to perfect a long roll, whether it's singles, doubles, or anything else. The problem is, from the perspective of the repertoire, we almost never encounter that. We never play a long roll in music. And when we do, it's almost always a buzz roll or a double stroke roll for, for effect as opposed, for, as opposed to musical expression. So I could work through two volumes of my own compositions. I could work through De La Clues. I could work through all of Pratt's material and anything else. I'm very, very unlikely to see something that calls for a, a single stroke roll produced in that way. A long roll that's played fast, loud, strong, clean. Instead, far more applicable, far more common are shorter roll figures either interspersed between accents or in the frise sense as I've demonstrated here. Now admittedly these first two single strokes are, are very close to exercises in their in their form but later on in, in the single stroke studies and certainly in, in the repertoire proper we see single strokes used in application and those applied single strokes as I've said are almost never, I can't think of a single example of just a long roll. Now in saying that I decided at that point to just pause the video and choose a book at random from my shelf. I've chosen Nine French American Rudimental Solos Volume 1 by Joseph Tompkins. And I've opened it up to a random page, which is study number five on page nine. The tempo is quarter note equals 160 BPM, or, or actually as it's written in the time signature of 2-2, two, two, uh, half note equals 80. Now this is a largely triplet based figure. So at section A, I know you don't have the, uh, I know you're unlikely to have to have access to this, but to kind of prove my point, if I take it from section A, and so on, and I'm sight reading that, so forgive the poor execution. But that is a typical example of a single stroke roll. It is single strokes applied in a triplet figure with an accent pattern. The musical phrase comes from the accents. Sorry. Lovely application of some frise of three there, by the way. and so on. And this, I, I know it's just a single example, but that is by far and away a more common use of single stroke rolls. In fact, let me go and find another one just so I can give you a second example. Now, just by way of a second example, I've, I've found my own book uh, that was conveniently on the stand here behind me, uh, the piece Decatria. Uh, specifically from bar 125, which was one of the sections in this piece that I really tried to include some single stroke based figures. It was, it was some ideas I was working with at the time. And if I play it, I'll play it nice and slowly because it's been a while since I've played this, but from bar 125. can hear there that the main body of the of the phrase of the musical passage comes from both the application of the frise and the accents around which they are placed there was simply no space in a musical solo for a long roll because that's simply not musical so all i'm really trying to say here is we've got something of a misconception that our single stroke roll should be judged on our ability to produce a long roll. Now my long roll is half decent. It's not better because I rarely have need to use it. My frise applications are very good because that's by far and away the way it mostly occurs in the repertoire. And, and like I showed in the Tompkins material, accented single stroke roll figures are far more likely to occur. So what we, I think, want to be focusing on mainly 
is our control, specifically in our ability to alternate cleanly between the two hands. And I think what we would find actually as a byproduct is our speed increases naturally as our control increases. Because you look at the fastest drummers in the world and they're not super muscular athletes. It's the technical control that allows them, allows them to bring the speed we probably all have to bear on the drums. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Um, I would encourage you all to go and look through your own repertoire or your own material and actually think about how your single stroke roll is employed. And I think for, all, for most intents and purposes, we will find that a long roll is very rarely it. Now, one of the exceptions I can possibly think of is a drum fill around the kit where we maintain a single stroke roll around da, 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 playing fast, maybe 16th notes or 30 seconds. But even then, I would actually conceptualize that as numerous consecutive instances of short rolls four on the snare four on the tom four on the tom four on the snare and that act of moving actually breaks up the figures into discrete short rolls now yes we can all find examples of a long roll but it's almost always as part of a climax or actually a technical showcase there's nothing wrong with that but for all intents and purposes we need the control we need the musical application to tie it all together so to try and recap what i've talked about today Think about your fulcrum. Is it static? Is it strong enough to hold that stick in position and allow the stick to rotate freely? Are the fingers engaging on every stroke? Is the wrist engaging to the appropriate degree to provide momentum and rhythmic stability? Have you got enough of a space at the top of your hand that that stick can move and open and close in the hand? And then finally, have you got enough control to actually play what you're trying to play? You might have a figure that's like, And you'll probably find your right hand can do it all. So practice it left-handed with your weak hand first. And you'll very quickly discover where the technical weakness lies. And one of the best ways to remedy that is in short frise figures. because that's forcing you to rely on clean articulation and control, working those fingers, working those wrists, and importantly, bringing those hands up to parity or something like. So I hope that's been useful for you. For those of you who want to explore this sort of material further, uh, the snare drum virtuoso, you can download a free sample from the website. I, of course, offer tuition on my website for those interested. And otherwise, please just get in touch and say hello and let me know how you're getting on. Thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers.